So we're going to begin the afternoon uh, with dance, movement, architecture. Uh, Marissa is uh, an amateur dancer, I want to say. Uh, I, I actually wanted to say more than amateur, but you've corrected me so many times that I'm not allowed to say that. Um, but you can tell by her posture compared to mine that there's something different here. Uh, but uh, she's really done an extraordinary job. Uh, I'm not going to reveal anything, so it's all a surprise. Uh, knitting together and finding ways to correlate uh, body health, well-being, movement, and uh, the works of architecture, and, and more. So, uh, Marissa, if you could take us to the heart of your thesis and to Manhattan and show us the way. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Marissa Liebash and I will be presenting my thesis on Architecture Through Dance, the Movement Experience. The agenda for today, I will run you through the scope of the project, the research I've been pursuing over the past year, then I will bring you to four specific, very carefully designed moments in the building where I, I have applied this research, then we will zoom out to the site and overall context of the building, and then I will bring you through the overall uh, design conceptual agendas, programmatic elements, and the building. So the scope. This thesis is an exploratory attempt to question whether the study of dance can make specific contributions to our conceptualization and formulation of human spatial relationships in architecture. This thesis questions what concepts about movement and the body can we as architects learn from the disciplines of dance. By analyzing architecture through the lens of dance, I believe much is to be learned by the way our bodies can move through the built environment. As Gar said, as an amateur dancer and choreographer for the past 10 years, I believe that dancers are more in tune with their bodies and their context. Um, I pursued an academic undergraduate education in architecture and I simultaneously developed a concentration in modern dance. As my um, knowledge of the, in the two fields progressed, the uh, similarities became undeniable. Through a series of dance and movement related exercises today, I will demonstrate how analyzing choreography in architecture can lead to a better understanding of human spatial relationships. I will then use these hypotheses to influence the design. Why is this important? This thesis serves as a model for cross-disciplinary work in the fields of dance and architecture, and uh, simultaneously I will use architecture as a tool to improve the well-being of the body. I have looked to much uh, cross-disciplinary work in the field, um, quite specifically Tesseracts of Time by Jessica Lang and Stephen Hall. And Stephen Hall quotes, the body moving through space in time is a central experience of both dance and architecture. Narrowing the scope a little bit more, um, I have looked specifically to choreographed works of dance. Choreography can be described as the art or practice of designing sequences, the planning and arranging of the movement steps and patterns of dancers. The connection I see here is a choreographer prescribes the space in which the body creates a dance. This dance, however, is shaped by the dancer's skill level, style, and narrative influence. It doesn't look the same for every person performing. Also, the context in which it is performed heavily influences the piece. Also, architects prescribe space for the body, the built environment. The experience of architecture is different based on the person's instinct, intrigue, background, culture. Architects essentially choreograph a person's path through space and architecture is not experienced the same way for every person. Both disciplines design space with different mediums. And looking at the etymology of the word choreography, in modern Greek it quite literally translates to dancing plus writing, but if we look back to ancient Greek, the word chora alludes to a land or territory outside the city, and philosophers have suggested this term to mean a receptacle or space or a clearing where beings begin to take place. So now I'd like to talk about my research in three larger areas, the first being set design and choreography, the next being Rudolf Laban's theories of the kinosphere, and the third being Laban movement analysis tested in different spatial typologies. 
First, I'm looking at set design and choreography. My interest in these two disciplines first sparked back in 2009 when I saw the architecture of dance festival uh, at Lincoln Center in New York where I saw this piece, Mirage, by Peter Martins, and where this kinetic set design piece moved with and interacted with the dancers. Later, four, four years later, um, I found that it was in fact designed by famous architect and engineer Santiago Calatrava. I also looked at set design piece Trajectory, which was designed by an LA-based dance company um, who employs kinetic set design pieces in their work. You can see a sense of equilibrium here as uh, the body and set design piece are dependent on each other. My hypothesis for this stage in the research states that spatial harmony is achieved by a symbiotic, responsive, dynamic relationship between the body and its context. The next stage in the research uh, lays its roots in Rudolf Laban and his ideas of the kinesphere. Uh, Rudolf Laban was, was a Hungarian um, dance artist and spatial theorist, and he basically believed that the body is divided into three planes, the vertical, the horizontal, and the sagittal. These three planes then create a 20-sided figure, or an icosahedron, which translates to what is known as the kinesphere, which is basically the space around the body that surrounds us within um, possible reaching extents. Here I am testing my own kinesphere. So I'm using William Forsyth, who is a famous uh, modern choreographer at this time, and his idea of improvisational technologies, where I'm mapping the forms that my body creates. I then superimpose them with uh, Laban's icosahedron, and I'm basically better understanding the periphery movements that my body makes in this, what is a seven foot sphere, typically, with, that surrounds the body. My, my hypothesis for this stage in the research uh, states that architecture can be used to test and challenge the kinesphere. This would theoretically mean that a seven foot dimension would appear in the architecture at a more human scale so that the body can become more spatially aware. The third part of the research manifests in Laban movement analysis. Um, I began looking uh, to Labanitation, which was derived by Rudolf Laban, um, and it's basically a notation system for choreographers and dancers to document a dance. It's basically a music score for dancers. However, this leaves no uh, stylistic information regarding the dance. Upon further research, I found Laban movement analysis. This is a method and language for describing, interpreting, and documenting all varieties of human movement. It provides, um, again, qualitative, stylistic information about human movement. My next stage in the research was to choreograph a short travel sequence or dance that could be tested in different spatial typologies. Here we see four larger conceptual agendas and one, one um, puts together different symbols for a leap, jump, turn, together in a Laban movement analysis motif. I then had the dancer perform this sequence in different spatial typologies. To the untrained eye, this sequence may look similar, but in using Laban movement analysis technique, we can see the changes in each typology. My hypothesis for this last stage in the research is that context significantly affects the way we move through space, more so than we as architects are aware of. We can use choreographic techniques like Laban movement analysis to analyze the way people are interacting with our built environment. More specifically here, I saw that when rhythm is introduced, the body tends to be more attentive to its motions. This promotes spatial and internal awareness. Now I would like to talk about how I've applied these hypotheses in my design. The first, deriving from uh, choreography and architecture, relates that adaptable spaces that respond to human use and movement. The next being employing rhythm and moving obstacles that promote spatial awareness. The third, a kinespheric measurement employed as a grid throughout the building. And lastly, a dynamic facade that responds to human movement. In demonstrating the dynamic relationship, I have designed a stretching studio. Here, users can take movable columns off the wall 
screw them into receptacles in the ground, and stretch a semi-transparent fabric uh, in between the columns to provide a more intimate environment. Next, demonstrating spatial awareness. These wooden piles are kinetic and move up and down, responding to the rhythm of human movement in this environment. I call it the pile chamber. Thirdly, we see the kinesphere as a unit of measure being employed as a grid on the floor. This is a motion tracking studio where a person's movements are tracked by the seven foot grid on the floor. And lastly, I've designed a motion tracking facade to demonstrate the responsive relationship. This facade is linked to the motion tracking studio and picks up the grid on the floor as a visual manifestation of the movement occurring in this building. Now we will zoom out to the site and context uh, of this design. So the program of this building, which I will delve into a little bit more after, um, calls for a rejuvenative, quiet, restful environment. One may argue that Lower Manhattan is not the most conducive environment for this, but I believe Pier 26 um, is a separate environment from the dense urban fabric of Tribeca and the open pier. The sounds of the water are soothing as you stand over the pier, the tide rolls in, the wind is very soothing, and uh, I believe it is one of the few places in New York where you can actually just take a breath. Relating back to the etymology of the word Cora, it means a clearing or void outside of the city. Here you see the void against the dense urban fabric. It also is situated on this larger promenade uh, owned by the Hudson River Land Trust. It's the largest uh, green project to undergo in Manhattan since Central Park. Um, and it's buffered by this linear park which separates it away from the West Side Highway. The Hudson River is a tidal estuary, meaning it flows in two directions. Um, the tide runs north for six hours and south for six hours, uh, with the approximate tidal height between four and six feet. This again relates to the ideas of movement and ephemerality and change. Another attribute uh, of this site that I was drawn to are the pile fields that flood the Hudson. They are uh, old wooden piles from deconstructed docks that have become a beautiful tidal marker on the Hudson on both the New Jersey and the New York side. Here we see the pier. Uh, it was reconstructed in the past 10 years under the Hudson River Land Trust. Um, it was built to support a one to two story building and it's most commonly used for cultural events such as concerts and fashion shows. On the southern portion of the site, we see two fendering systems to dock two 100-foot vessels. I think it's a nice connectivity between land and water. This site is a palimpsest, uh, meaning it has successive historical layers that can be apparent on the surface. We see the Hudson River. It too was uh, an old wooden dock, now deconstructed, and still leaves the old wooden piles underneath. Then the new concrete beam, uh, columns and transfer beams sit underneath a six foot thick concrete deck. So here you see the piles underneath the dock. As I uncovered the layers uh, of this palimpsest, I found that the old wooden piles are spaced approximately seven feet apart. A nice alignment with Laban's unit of measure. Now we'll get into the design. The concept for this building is to promote and celebrate the movement of the human body. I believe architecture can be used as a tool to awaken and fine tune and test the body for self-actualization. The journey through this building is one of highly sensory, exerted experiences to rest and rejuvenation. Architecture, I believe, should take advantage of sensory design, especially tactile muscular, in order to improve the body's spatial perception. The different paths through the building challenge the body with obstacles influenced by the seven-foot grid. 
It is a center for movement and wellness, and here you can see the four larger conceptual agendas I used in choreographing the short travel sequence in the beginning of my research. <laughs> On the eastern portion of the site, you prepare for your day of exertion. Along the periphery, we see the exertive categories. In the center is the decompressive zone, quieter, darker, more privatized. And at the end, we end with rejuvenation over the end of the pier. For your attention, design boards. So one enters the site through the eastern portion, which are funneled through just south of the existing boathouse and restaurant, uh, into the pier uh, through the lobby. You process up the stairs or elevator to the second floor where most of the main activity occurs. Here, in the preparatory section of the building, you see the changing areas. You process through and are given a view out to the Hudson. Then, moving through, still preparing for your day, you arrive at the stretching studio where the movable columns come off the wall, stretch the fabric in between to meditate or stretch. Then we come to the pile chamber where one can move through and interact with the kinetic piles. Then your path can split to the northern or southern part of the building. To the north lies the motion tracking studios. To the south, a water sequence of rain chambers or fountain chambers. The center, decompression, houses the massage studios, showers, and steam rooms. At the end of the pier, the grid, seven foot grid that has appeared in the building, dissipates as you end in the soap pool as a rejuvenative experience. Here in the section, you can see a slight inclination in the floor, which the person realizes while moving through the building, uh, again, emphasizing exertion or challenge. I explored the idea of rhythm in solid solid void and void relationships. This really became a catalog uh, for me to implement the design. Here in the section perspective, you see the southern part of the design where light filtrates, infiltrates through the facade and warms this watertight experience. In the center, we see the steam room, darker, more privatized, and on the northern side, we see the motion tracking studios where northern uh, ambient light is best for this type of environment. Uh, underneath the more public side of the deck, we see different piercings. Um, this one showcases a hammock where you can rest and listen to the sounds of the water. And other parts of the deck pierce where you can see um, stretched metal fabric that are basically handmade, man-made oyster beds. This is the idea that the oysters will help rejuvenate the Hudson as this is a rejuvenative building. In the wall section, through the southern facade, we see glass panels housing solar pads. Uh, this building is pretty atypical for New York being that it has complete southern exposure to the sun. And this is housing solar energy here, and the LED lights can pierce through the glass, illuminating the facade. So to conclude, I have learned a lot about choreography and dance through this research, but I have also learned a lot about representation. We as architects tend to use static drawings to represent our work, and by diagramming or, or drawing, we can predict the way that people will move through our built environment. However, chore choreographers and dancers commonly use the technique of a green screen, where they film a person's movements and then superimpose them on a prototype design. I too have employed this methodology and technology for demonstrating my hypotheses the way people move through space. So, what concepts about movement and the body can we as architects learn from the disciplines of dance? Here I am demonstrating the dynamic relationship seen in the stretching studio. A person takes a column off the wall, screws it into a receptacle in the ground, 
and the fabric is stretched across. The space becomes adaptable and changes with user number, type, etc. In demonstrating spatial awareness in the pile chamber, these piles are kinetic and move from the ceiling where a person can move through and interact with the rhythmic changing of these piles. Again, bringing back the vernacular nature of the wooden piles under the pier and throughout the Hudson. Thirdly, the kinosphere as a unit of measure. Here we see the grid on the ground, spaced seven feet apart, in which the dancer moves over and the grid tracks the motion on the ground. I've designed reflective surfaces to bounce the reflection of the Hudson River back to the mirrors onto the ground to give the illusion that the dancer is performing over water. And lastly, the responsive relationship seen on the motion tracking facade. This is a visual manifestation of the movement occurring in the building as the lights uh, illuminate the facade based on the dancer's movement in the motion tracking studio. In conclusion, I believe architects can take advantage of cross-disciplinary works such as dance and choreography to heighten user experience and design. Through the lens of dance, I have illustrated my hypotheses regarding how people interact with and move through design environments. Architecture here is employed as a tool to fine tune and awaken and test the body for self-actualization. Thank you to my committee members, Professor Rock Garth Rockcastle, Professor Madeline Simon, and Professor Michelle Lem Krakos for your unconditional support over the past year. Also Karen Bradley, the certified movement analyst who aided uh, the Laban movement analysis motifs and Anthony Barisi for helping with videography and animation. I would now like to open the floor to questions, comments, mild criticism. Any of you? Well, I I mean, it's, it's very interesting stuff, and, uh, and it's really nicely done. I, and I hate to start this way, but I wish I saw exterior views to see what the building mm. looks like. You know, because at the end of the day, I would like to see the artifact also as a result of all of the exploration sure. to, to sort of tie it together, because that's what we do, you know? And, and, um, and you've given some really seductive and um, intriguing sort of Views, and I can imagine it'd be awesomely wonderful, with, you know, with that sort of section that sort of slips around like that. I'd like to see the side, <coughs> the side of the big fish, mm. you know, um, just just to know. I'll, I'll tag onto that. I want to commend you on your your wall section length. I think this is probably one of the most detailed versions of a wall section we've seen today, and I I find it very exciting to. Uh, to, you know, to hear about your kind of big thesis ideas and then to see it brought down to a very specific scale of the material making of the building and the architectonic expression of the building. Um, because I, I, I think at the end of the day, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road in our profession. Um, you know, all of us are going to have different opportunities to work with different clients and design different building types. And today we've seen a number of theses that uh, are exploring different building types and different mm -hmm. problems, and that represents people's personal interests. But but this is a common language we all have to work in, is the material right. expression of the building. So um, I really like where this is going. I'd, I'd like you to maybe spend a couple, uh, you talked a little bit about the, the glass and the, um, the photovoltaics that are happening and things like that, but it looks like you've got some other things going on with maybe a chain downspout. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to maybe uh, ex ex spend a little more time on the section and share some of that. Sure. Uh, so again, this is the movement track the facade. Uh, the solar pads are housed on the exterior. Then a rigid, almost grid, also houses the electrical equipment uh, for the LED lights, tied back with a truss. 
Here, this is a section through the rain chamber, um, kind of a public bathing element to, for the building. Uh, the water is funneled underneath the teak decking, and then the grid, again, is carried uh, through the underside of the deck with rain chains. Uh, you can also see here, uh, with rain chains that filter back into the Hudson. Now, I have a question about um, your, your original uh, design idea that you know, exploring dance is, is going to help us understand how people move through buildings. Um, did you look at how people move through buildings if they're not engaged in dance? Did you, did you just start by backing up even a step before that? Right, yes. I, I have looked at that, you know, different um, spatial configurations, whether they be free and open, linear, having a rhythmic procession. But for this exercise, I believe that using dance is more of an emphatic way of moving through a building. And with the untrained eye, people can see that differential change uh, more. I, I want to tack on to that. I mean, I think that what's, what's interesting about this is, you, is that the, the research and the focus on dance as a way of understanding the human body and movement really, I think, yields some basic theories about human beings and ergonomics and how people move that you need to generalize. Mm. I mean, I think, I think what's underlying your question is, is you, then, you decide to make a building uh, that in fact is, is, is a fairly specific uh, example of a building to carry on movement, dance. Right. So, but you could very well have done a thesis, and I'm not asking you to reconsider the thesis, but it would be interesting to have drawn from this the general, sort of the general principles. Uh, I'm involved in, with Gallaudet University, which is a university for the hearing impaired, and they've come up with something called deaf space principles. They've, got a, 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 they've actually created a handbook, they've created an institute on, on what does it mean to design architecture and space for people who have, are hearing impaired. Um, it would be really interesting for you to go on to a PhD, for example, and actually uh, generalize on this, draw, draw the conclusions that you've learned by doing this that uh, that could apply or should apply perhaps to any building. I mean, I think, so what I like about the thesis is it really is, at one level, uh, a kind of basic research about a way of, of understanding movement and the, the, the way people move through the physical environment. The other thing is I can't help, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time on, on sailboats and boats, and I keep looking at this, especially the section. Uh, I, I spent two weeks on a boat in the Mediterranean earlier this year, and, you know, the floor is always sloping, and, you know, that you're moving sometimes through narrow passages, and there's sometimes uh, places where you have to step over a threshold. I mean, you know, I, I was very aware of the sort of choreographic demands of being on a ship, uh, moving uh, in the Mediterranean. Anyway, I could help uh, when I looked at these, thinking about about the analogy, if you will, uh, and you could apply this to designing a ship. I mean, if you were a naval sure. architect, you might want to know something about how people move to be intelligent about the design of ships. Anyway, I, I, I applaud the rigor with which you've you've pursued this. Not to, and I think the the use of the video uh, is very helpful in understanding it. But I I, I could easily see. Uh, this being just as interesting where you have designed something that's not necessarily, right. it could have been a, cu a cooking school, mm -hmm. or it could have been whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, I have a friend of mine who would always say, if you want to make a something, um, uh, you know, take a, you want to defamiliarize the program in terms of its context, so if you're designing a library, maybe you take over a gas station, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there, you know, where, 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 where is the resistance uh, of, of the project right. ultimately lie? And, um, you know, I think these are always really hard projects. I have to commend you for, I mean, a very precise um, introduction, and um, you were very directed and very driven in terms of the issues that you were interested in investigating. I think that's you should be really commended for that. Um, you know, I, at the end of the day, um, you know, where 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 are we? And I, and I look at your sites up here, 
And piers are always, I think, historically been really interesting sites. You know, um, there's the, the Santa Monica Pier, or there is the Pier in what is it, Bath, England. You know, there are always places that are sort of outside of the city. They're typical carnivals or fairs or thing, you know, places where things a little bit out of the ordinary might happen, where you lose yourself a little bit and, and, and then return back to the, to the city. Uh, um, and, and so I think as a site, it's a really interesting choice, a great choice, actually, to sort of occupy the fringe, the edge of the city, which it once used to be very industrial, and now it's transforming into something very different. And then I think about some of the things that you're doing, and, and I think you've sort of, in a really great way, transcended the specifics, in a way, even though they still exist in moments, of your research. And maybe this goes back to the question that you have about you know, the outside of the building, but I think ultimately when I look at your project, I really think about its potential as an interface between the occupants, the, the, the way in which we move through the day, you know, with all of our Fitbits and our watches and our, you know, mapping our spatial experiences, and how the building, or a building, or architecture might begin to map or demonstrate or celebrate uh, or brand those movements. And I, I, to me, that's a really fantastic point of departure. And, and I think a place where you've ended up, and obviously, just as the office building lights go on and off you know, across the water, you're, you're building on that token moment of the lights moving in on and off that are mapping the choreography of the interior, I think is a really beautiful, beautiful idea. Which, you know, whether it's, you know, and, and these chains where water, you know, from above is dribbling down through the piers, the underbelly of the kind of boat that's been lifted above the pier. So I think you're, they're beginning to be this, these really beautiful moments. And so for me, if there was a criticism, it would be that I would have perhaps been maybe left behind a little bit of the research that you already did, you know, of the, the studios and the, this and that, and seen how it could sort of holistically get that, and, and what, whether it's a, a dance studio or a shopping mall or whatever it is, but how does the building as a series of skins and surfaces begin to move in space, not necessarily literally move, but at times, but how can it breathe, how can photovoltaic cells open and close skins. I mean, we have Jean Nouvel's was a building way back when in Paris, the Moldave, that had all these sort of lenses that responded to the environment. So the notion that it becomes a kind of, you know, a kind of a fantastic and all, in the real term of a fantastic project on the edge of the, of the city, I think is really fantastic. Um, and just my last comment is, so I think going, you know, at, at the end of the day, the, the plans itself are quite prosaic, you know. They're and you know, and, and whether they're it's a shy office suite or you know, they're really. So maybe if it is really dance, and then maybe this the whole notion of transformability of space. Maybe they really there is a grid, and it is a constantly transforming space. So I love these these you know that you've actually paid attention for the first time I think today, but to representation, like how does the way you kind of draw and the way you study your ideas begin to impact the project itself, and I really respect that. I think that maybe you never had to show a plan. Maybe you could have gone on a limb with your critics and said, I'm not showing a plan because that's, you know, I'm really just showing that, that beautiful, I don't know if that's yours or not, that blurred drawing, is that, is that yours? Yeah, I would have liked to see the whole project as a series of, of blurs, of transformative spaces from the, as an interior, but also as an exterior, that, that it's like an bacon you know, uh, a painting that's sort of constantly transforming and blurring, never fixed, right? Yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Um, Marissa, as you know, I share this interest with you, so it's really exciting <laughs> to see how, how the project has developed. Um, I wanted to build on some of the things that um, Andrea just said, and maybe start at the end, thinking about the question of representation. And I guess one of the, one of the things that I really feel about this, the, what you've done, is that it's a wonderful launching point for you in terms of a whole set of um, threads that I imagine you'll continue. So the idea, just in the experiments you did with the representation there, um, that seemed to open up a whole other set of mm -hmm. ideas, right? Of how do we really try to understand how people move through space and what the implications are of our designs when in the past we didn't even include figures in them, right? right. So now we're doing that. Um, I, I also want to commend you on the, the research that you can, that you did. Um, the bond movement analysis is a really wonderful um, choice. And then I want to think about this idea in, in an extension, uh, maybe building some of these remarks. So I had the experience of taking the architecture exam on one of these piers. And there was a point, and it was at the point also where you brought your drawing boards, which no one does anymore, right? And there are probably a thousand of us taking the exam on the pier. And it was the design exam. And at a certain point, um, this was a building that kind of like there was just windows on one side. 
Um, the John F. Kennedy air aircraft carrier pulled up to our pier. And everybody <laughs> got up and stopped okay. working on the exam, even though we had only 12 hours or whatever we <laughs> um, And walked to the window to see this thing come up, which was as big as, I don't know, an 18-story building, and I don't remember how many thousands of people it helped. Um, that image has stayed with me, and I think, you know, again, I think about Andrew's point reminded me of this experience, because what if you're here, if there was this other sense of movements happening, right? What if boats still docked on this pier? Um, how would that influence what's happening inside and what people are doing? Um, what about, you know, these other kinds of, again, I'm, I'm throwing this out because your work teases this, this other, these other ideas out, sort of the rhythm of the city. Um, the, the, imagine if there was a circus on the top of the pier. Like, what things could also happen that are at a different scale, but remind us of that kind of change of season and time uh, and, and effort. So that, I just want to leave you with a sense of that boat, that as long as your entire pier kind of coming up here, um, and then how one of the things in architecture that we do is also not just chart and choreograph people, but you know, as Corbusier talks about putting a wall up to catch the sun, how does your building also start to create a structure within which we start to capture perhaps the movement of the moon and the sun, et cetera? Did you want to respond? So about the boat. <laughs> Thank you. No, I appreciate it. It's a big boat. <laughs> was that in New York? Yes, I took the exam on one of these years. Oh, wow. So a lot of people sank on that exam. <laughs> <laughs> I think it gave us extra inspiration. But I think scales are really another element you might have deployed. Right. Like I think of Dakira Crow's mannequins and um, yeah, I think of Dakira Crow's mannequins, you know, and, and his haunting paintings that are much, much larger than life scale mm -hmm. that and um, you know, it seems to me that, and even the Triadish Ballet from the Bauhaus, you know, those mm -hmm. were constructions of costumes that actually mm -hmm. construct the space of the right. stage. And so, it seems, in a sphere also. Yeah, so, so that might have been another sort of element we talked about, that big boat, you know, that suddenly right. you're completely dwarfed. So how does your project begin to interact with its mm -hmm. environment at, 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 at multiple scales? I, I think that's a really important idea. You, you know, you're talking about the scale of this kind of seven-foot grid, right? How does that then become... 70 feet and how does it become 700 feet right and i think being able to go from small elemental scale units to things that have to span 70 right. feet uh is is a big deal yeah and and you know i know that we're seeing uh, a, a truss uh if, you know organized vertically along your curtain wall here but um are those uh, panel points are they seven feet apart for instance i mean have mm -hmm. you have you taken some of these ideas and, and really uh, exploited them in, right. in a lot of different ways. I'd like to see it with your structure spanning the large spaces, you know, that kind of thing. I think right. there's, I think you did do uh, just a tremendous amount of research that could have, uh, you know, if, again, I think like we've said with other people, if, if you had another six months or another year to keep working on this sure. and getting your PhD, you could take these things to these other levels, but it's, uh, it's, it's beautifully uh, represented very evocative. I want to commend you also. Thank you. I have to make two points. One is historical, uh, that you probably don't know, but the Air Force Academy in Colorado, is designed by Skid Moines and Merrill, mm -hmm. is based on a seven foot module, oh. vertically, horizontally, and elsewhere. It's based on the bed size. Just oh. FYI, people might be interested in that. Uh, but you know, w w one example, uh, again, of, of where there's even a, a a, a, a very direct relationship between how people move and architecture is the design of, a, of stairs, of stairs mm -hmm. moving vertically. You know, there's some stairs one can design, uh, like, uh, you know, a lot of them, like this one here, which is basically, you know, you, you just go down or up. Uh, but, but if one does something different with the stair in terms of its, uh, uh, its dimensions and how it moves through space, the stair itself, but people will actually descend the stair probably in a slightly different way. They, I mean, they, the stair might choreograph one's movement, so yeah, to speak. So, right. I mean, there are, it would be interesting to take, that, this is what I was getting at when I made my earlier remarks, that there, excuse me, there are certain things one can actually do in the, in the configuration and deployment of structure and space in a building that would affect how people move. 
Right. I was going to say something after you, um, after me. Um, Peter, then we'll keep going around. Um, first of all, I was a little late, but I, I think you presented this without showing Marcel Duchamp's new Descending a Staircase, right? Yes. Congratulations, his first thesis about dance I've seen where somebody hasn't used that image. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing to me is how you might, a couple of points, one, how you might translate the lessons of dance that you learn in a building like this into things like Roger's talking about, into more normative conditions. Right, so, right. so the average Beaux-Arts architect understood spiral movement, how people spiraled up staircases, mm -hmm. and the sort of rise to run ratios that made for graceful movement, and things like that, which, which were incorporated into normal buildings that weren't necessarily right. about dance. Right. And that would be an interesting thing. I also want to get back to a question that was raised earlier about the exterior. I mean, the scale of the river is vast. So, you know, were you to take this and design the building from the outside in, you might actually have a different idea about scale right. here because this is a really a huge territory. You know, Rudy made the point about the aircraft carrier showing up. It strikes me that maybe maybe simpler forms, I think the building is quite faceted, as much as I can tell. It, it could well be that a different strategy would be to have a slightly more um, uh, sort of simpler approach to the form so that the, the from a great distance the shape of it could be more identified mm -hmm. you know so it could control the scale or at right. least address the scale of the Hudson River Valley a little bit more you know in that regard in which case it might lead you to a, a perhaps a more simpler kind of structure in the building I know there is a kind of grip mm -hmm. that doesn't register as easily in the plan and the reason I say that is because so oftentimes buildings outlive their uses. Right. So something that might be more adaptable or at least thought about as being adaptable to future uses with a simpler form would probably allow that to happen. That's valid. Marissa, I really liked your presentation. I thought you did a wonderful job. And my comment touches on some of the things that uh, Melanie and Roger brought up about um, structure and, and movement through space, like things such as staircases. As I understand it, you, you've, choreo you've made a choreography of experience, right? And you get people out to this end point. And as I understand it, you would just then maybe move back through all of those spaces again. I think there could be opportunity to bring people down and then out into the landscape. And then all of those things that you experience with your body, learning about movement, after you went through this, program in place, then you would be moving back towards the city at the ground plane, yeah. outside, and perhaps continuing that um, exploration of movement and right. body awareness underneath the building that you've created. So um, I think there's an opportunity there to think about not how you also, how you move with your body out to the end, but then how do you get back right, and, right. and approach and, and get back into the, the city itself from this kind of liminal place that's outside the city. Because certainly the, the direction moving with the city to your back feels very different than moving back sure. or towards the city. And so really, you know, celebrating that and then also thinking how do people get down mm -hmm. gives you that, you know, the challenge that people have posed for you for us. And what if there's an observatory at the end? Something also that directs yeah, your or, gaze. Or you, you go oh. up and you come back across the roof. So then you just don't go back the same way. Right, you right. The Hiroshima, not the Hiroshima, the um, Yokohama ferry terminal, did you study that? Mm -hmm. It's probably worth looking at um, in Japan. And in that, it's a whole surface that's kind of bending, and you're outside of it, but then you can go inside and actually back, and you're in a much darker space. Uh, worth, worth checking out. Mm -hmm. Also, the maritime youth center. Well, briefly, the question is this whole notion of this, the scale of the building having to do with things other than the program. Mm -hmm. You know, that going out to the edge of the city, going out to the edge, you know, standing on the water. Right. You know, any program having that experience would be would be heightened. Could, could be heightened by the building. Right. You know, that you're out there looking up and down the river and things, no matter what the program is. And 
so you know, Peter's point about going up one way and coming back another would perhaps give you those different perspectives that you would see right, right. make the building heighten the sense of where you are in the space. I wanted to shift gears a little bit and move from the scale, uh, more purely architectural idea of this, uh, to, to time and community. One of the things that I'm now thinking about that you've moved me to in the process of, of uh, the thesis is, and, and I was thinking of some sort of uh, baths as well, uh, and what I felt after a day spending in his bath and how much in, in his project and how much I wanted to return, but because I was a visitor, I, I really wasn't part of a community and it is a bit dislocated so it doesn't foster community, but your site would very much be a catalyst for a certain cross-section, quite a large cross-section of New Yorkers who, who would come to think of themselves, you know, from their uh, uh, well-being to how it is that they uh, move, engage, see, uh, and I'm imagining actually a community of members who are now over years becoming uh, deeply engaged with the kind of programs that are occurring here and how likely you're, you know, and I think you know this, you've touched on a number of initial ideas, but I can imagine, like the comment that over time, the agendas uh, that would be uh, likely to catalyze and continue to refine and develop programmatic dimensions of how these instruments inside this building would continue to right. be pursued creatively, mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 then I uh, and feeling that and trying to imagine living in this building and pretending that I was uh, in good enough shape uh, myself to warrant, you know, let's say membership, because I, I think one is going to have to be pretty good at cultivating self and bodiness, you, you, you know, slouches uh, you feel <laughs> awkward here pretty quickly. Um, how much the building is vacant in a way, and I want to share this with you kind of in the spirit of collaboration, you know, as a, as a, a critic who spent a fair amount of time with you thinking about these ideas and then thinking about how the building actually feels uh, not as much a part of a community as one could imagine. In other words, is it mixed use enough? You know, is it a place you might go uh, more casually and be uh, identified with and celebrating and supporting and advocating and admiring, you know, intergenerational? I started thinking about all of these dimensions that would be wonderful if this really could become an institution and not just a spa, you know, kind of right. thing. And so I want I want to encourage you too to go there. That that this is where time uh, as it becomes a part of our discipline more and more uh, becomes a part of our discipline and regeneration becomes more and more a part of the ethic of architecture. That I wanted to take the earlier observations and put it on steroids a bit and imagine this as a community in a community of adherents who are committed to well-being and to the health of their bodies and more deeply sensual about environment and about, I love the, the reference to solar rhythms and the notion that you go there to be at one with all kinds of flows. I love the, the idea of this water going in and out. Uh, and so um, I wanted to say bravo, but you've just opened Pandora's box. You know? And I, I think there's so many things here that, that uh, awaken in me, so I wanted to thank you for taking me there and imagining uh, with you something even much more than your thesis. Because they will be get to pragmatically in a couple semesters. Let me just quickly take on one thing that it also made me think about is that generally the dance community is probably the least wealthy community. I mean, they really struggle. They're on the edge. And so it's also interesting to think about yeah. not only the rest of us moving around, but just if, is this a place for the dance community, but the fact that it's on the edge of the city. Um, you know, just when you were talking about the community of people is an interesting thing sure. to consider. Well, the piers have been, have been inhabited, inhabited by public uses 
Chelsea Piers and oh, yeah. it's, it's where that stuff is tended to gravitate in Manhattan. Is there space? Well, I, I hate to stop this, this really interesting conversation, but uh, I get the last word. <laughs> so uh, I, I'd like to say that it's a tenet of design thinking that great user experience begins with empathy. And Marissa uh, began her design process with a deep empathy for her users uh, by her understanding of their embodied experience. And she brought her very well-developed kinesthetic sense to understanding this place and how people move through places. And she took that kinesthetic understanding to, uh, I think, a, quite a deep analysis of the relationship between specific places and specific human experience. Um, I, I'd like to say that uh, Marissa is a, a a great ambassador, she really exemplifies the strength of our three and a half year program that brings an intellectually diverse group of students who enrich the academic experience, both for other students and for faculty. Uh, this has been a, a really great learning experience for me. And I, you know, I too share the interest in dance. You've you know, really expanded my understanding of the connections between dance and architecture. Um, Marissa has has spent the past year um, integrating her substantial knowledge about dance that she brought from her you know, pre-Maryland life uh, with her growing expertise in architecture. And um, in working with Marissa last year in the integrated studio, I got to know her as a student with, with a really deep understanding of structure. And this year, I, I feel like other, you know, she, she sort of uh, blossomed in, in other ways that make her an even more well-rounded architect. Um, I think the artistic explorations here, and um, I would just also like to point out that the um, uh, Marissa, I think, took, took as a challenge the idea of movement, movement of people, movement in this place, and uh, she said, I need to find new ways to represent movement. And so all of the wonderful animations and videography that we saw today, I think is a new development in Marissa's professional life. And so I'd like to, uh, like to applaud this, this thesis. You, you took, uh, I think, all parts of yourself and stretched and uh, certainly brought our committee. It's been a great pleasure working with Michelle and Mark. You brought all of us along on a, a great journey, and we've been, uh, we've been moved. Thank you.